Hi, thank you. Um, so today I'm talking about um, Lustre 2.5 and beyond. Um, you know, as with anything, this is <clears throat> speculative. Um, and I just wanted to take a minute at the at the beginning to discuss about um, you know the process by which features are landing into Lustre, and there's you know continual stream of different developments ongoing, and we need to, you know as our user base grows and the the requirements of testing and things like that are increasing with Lustre. It's never an easy product to test. Uh, we've gotten a bit more rigorous with our um, feature submission process. You know, if people recount days of yore, you know, we would have a feature, you know, written in a week and then it would go into production, you know, as soon as it compiled or something like that. And, uh, you know, those days are gone. So now we actually have, um, a th for, for major features, we have a three-month um, cutoff in advance. So there's, as Peter mentioned, we have a, a, a six-month cycle between um, the feature releases. And so halfway through that cycle, um, we expect that, you know, the first three months is open for, you know, patch and feature landings. And then three months before the release is when we cut off um, the features. And, you know, we, it's not just a matter of um, people submitting, um, you know, patches and then it can be landed, you know, we have to understand what those features are doing and um, how to test them and things like that. And so, you know, the bar is, is hopefully um, being raised continually in terms of documentation and design, um, test plans. And, um, you know, I just wanted to emphasize that, uh, you know, for those people developing features, the three-month cutoff is for the features to be landed. So starting your, your feature submission well in advance of that um, gives everybody time to go through the patches because, I mean, 2.4, uh, it was pointed out that 2.4 is a, a very big release and there was a lot of, of code and features going into there. But even in hopefully the smaller 2.5 and 2.6 releases, there, there's issues with integration between patches as well. And um, so what might have tested in isolation, fine, you know, there, there may be other interactions with other features coming in. And um, <clears throat> so two months before the release, um, we, we want to get documentation and the feature testing um, plans completed. And so documentation is kind of a new well, unfortunately, kind of a new requirement for features. Um, so there's a, uh, if people aren't aware, there's a Lustre project, LU doc, um, for tracking feature updates and there's a Git repo, sorry, uh, for updating the documentation and Richard Hedges, uh, Henwood, um, has a presentation on Lustre, the Lustre manual and how to contribute. And uh, T minus one month, which is the f area we're in right now, um, we're only landing bug fixes and uh, working on just blockers to get the release, you know, stable and out the door. And, uh, you know, this is definitely um, an improvement over past years, but I think it's really contributed to uh, the stability um, of an ongoing basis. And of course, the, the features that I'm listing here are, um, I don't know why that's, oh, that's why, um, you know, speculative, and they're not for sure going to be in any release, but I've put in numbers beside the release to give you an estimate of when they're coming out. And you can see at the bottom the, uh, the URL for um, features, and, you know, if, if you're thinking of working on something, it always makes sense to uh, contact, you know, the mailing lists and to look at the wiki here to see what other people are working on so you don't necessarily um, duplicate effort. Um, so, and there's, there's some features that are um, already being discussed in other presentations, so I'm not really going to cover them here. I'm only going to be talking about 
um, new features that are um, not otherwise having presentations at this lug. Um, so distributed namespace is an ongoing project to uh, do horizontal scaling of the metadata servers. We had phase one, went into Lustre 2.4, and that was really a culmination of, you know, six or seven years of effort, um, starting with the clustered metadata project as like 2005 maybe. Um, and we're moving forward uh, with the, the phase two of DNE. Um, which is giving Stripe directories and more um, improvements to the tools and usage. Um, Luster file system check, again, another OpenSFS project. We've had phases one and 1 1.5 um, are landed in, in Luster 2.3 and 2.4. 2.5 and 2.6 will see further checking um, for uh, distributed. The, the earlier phases were local checking to the metadata server. The later phases are um, checking of the distributed consistency and if anybody's ever used the existing LFS check tool you'll be happy to see that this one is being developed. Um, Deos is exascale IO infrastructure um, and Eric Barton is giving a presentation on that and Fujitsu has a number of different features that are um, started to land uh, in Lustre 2.4 and will be going on um, as, you know, I don't know how long it'll take, but they have a number of other features going in. So one interesting feature that is sort of not a feature in itself, but has come about um, through work that CEA has done um, for HSM. Um, they did a lot of work to get the, the layout lock and um, object data versioning ready for HSM and the development turned out um, in the you know last month or so to allow us to do data migration um, between OSTs, which is sort of a an early um, glimpse at 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 how to allow you know storage tiering and things like that. Um, the 2.4 functionality is is very you know basic at this point. Um, you know it allows you to move one file from one OST, well, even simpler, it essentially just allows you to swap the layouts between two files. And what you can do is copy a file to a new file that resides on some other set of OSTs. You swap the layouts, which means that, you know, the objects from the first file are switched with the objects of the second file, and now you've migrated, and you delete the you know, old data, and you've migrated. And so this is a very cool functionality um, that's, um, you know, wasn't touted as, as a feature by itself, but um, the LFS migrate command uh, is definitely usable. Um, it, it doesn't really do anything, you know, by itself. It doesn't do automated storage tiering or anything, load balancing, but the, definitely the functionality is there to be exploited in the future by, like, Robinhood or something like that. Um, you know, to say, oh, this OST is full, I'm going to balance rather than pushing it off to the archive or something like that. Or you can have, you know, your SSDs and your HDDs and your, you know, made storage or whatever it is. And I think it opens up a whole world of possibilities. So, um, you know, people can start playing with that. And, uh, you know, I look forward to seeing interesting things that people are doing in the future. Um, HSM, of course, as Peter uh, had mentioned, is a really major feature and it's been also in progress for a while. Um, so there's, there's a very, I think, a very simple and uh, a useful infrastructure um, for integrating with different types of backend storage archives. And it's, the good news about it is there's not really much mechanics inside of Lustre um, for integrating with the backend archives. It's all um, in user space, a copy tool, you know, that has a simple API, it gets commands, and then it's up to the copy tool to decide how to, in, to you know, transfer data over to um, the backend archive. So there's um, initially HPSS and POSIX. Um, I've heard a number of times that other organizations are, are developing uh, copy tools for their archive solution. 
um, you know, I look forward to announcements on that as well. Um, so this uses, um, HSM uses a Robinhood policy engine that CEA also developed. And really that's the smarts behind, um, behind HSM. And, uh, you know, it decides what files to keep, what files to, you know, push to archive, when to release them. Um, you know, it, it has a, a, a sophisticated language for specifying trees and users and, you know, file name extensions, whatever you want. And that's again in, in user space. So Lustre doesn't need the complexity of understanding everything. Um, and it can be, you know, made as sophisticated as we want. And so for 2.4, the, largely the, uh, the client side changes have landed. Um, which again, you know, like I mentioned, that gives us even the ability to just do simple file migration between OSTs. The server side changes are under development, and um, you know, I've, in in uh, you know, I don't know, apology is the right word, but um, the unfortunate thing is that HSM it uh, the code was has been ready for a while. It it was had a lot of conflict with the, uh, some other work that was being done for ZFS. And so um, Peter had said that the code wasn't quite ready, but in truth, the, uh, um, there's a bunch of conflicts and it had to be reworked for the new um, server stack. And so, you know, it was close to making it in, but um, despite, you know, major efforts from CEA, the uh, code didn't, didn't get landed, and uh, but I look forward to this going into 2.5. And uh, as I mentioned, you know this this is going to provide a really useful um, infrastructure for all kinds of cool features that you know are interested interesting to users. Um, data migration, replication, um, you know storage tiers and pools, OST pools, and so I think that'll be a powerful um, functionality. Um, so another interesting feature that's um, fairly close on the horizon is uh, the client extended attribute cache. Um, so as, as, you know, kernels and file systems um, progress, the user applications also are, are using a lot more of extended attributes. If you have SE Linux enabled, you know, there's um, all kinds of security tagging, there's search engine tools that use extended attributes. And um, currently Lustre fetches extended attributes from the server every single time they're accessed. Um, and really if you're running, or Samba is a major, major user of extended attributes. So this will provide um, a very good uh, improvement on the performance on the clients to cache the extended attributes, not only a, a a positive cache to say, you know, I have this extended attribute, but also, especially for SE Linux and other labeling type technologies, they, you know, check on every single access whether there's, you know, uh, a security tag, and you can also cache the the negative aspect so that that extended attribute doesn't exist, and um, you know that'll save you a lot of RPCs, and. Um, I look forward to that one. Um, client updates. This is really an area I think that has benefited immensely from um, from community involvement. On the other slides, I listed at the top the uh, the contributor of the feature, but this one is actually too long a list to fit into the title. Um, you know, EMC, Oak Ridge, SUSE, Livermore, Intel, uh, NRL. You know, really, there's a lot of of people that are interested in keeping Lustre up to date with the latest um, client kernels. There's a lot more work going into updating the server kernels. Uh, it's obviously, an, you know, it's a, an ongoing treadmill. And um, in the past, um, you know, at WAM Cloud and Sun and, you know, back to days of yore, we only really followed the uh, the vendor releases because that's what the majority of our customers were using. But, um, you know, it's, it's getting easier to, to uh, you know, build Lustre on newer kernels and that, um, you know, it takes an ongoing effort because if you know the kernel 
development, they, uh, they don't give a wit about compatibility inside the kernel. And so there's a constant churn of APIs and, and work that needs to be done to keep uh, Lustre working. Um, there's, of course, uh, an interest in getting Lustre into the, the kernel proper. Um, the bad news is that it, there was, you know, 10 years of work, um, you know, that needs to be cleaned up. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely going forward. And that's, uh, uh, you know, thanks to EMC. Um, so the codes, you know, there's coding style. There's a lot of um, the wrapper, portability wrappers that were added for Solaris and Windows and Mac OS. But the unfortunate thing is that that work has resulted in um, added complexity in the client code and performance issues. And it's not really providing any benefit. And so um, we've been working on cleaning up the wrappers so that the, the portable API for Lustre is the Linux kernel API and the other ones, you know, are implementing a, a Linux kernel-like library, essentially. libcfs is now going to be like a Linux kernel library so that the code, main code, can be clean. Um, there's some, you know, open discussion on whether we should just delete um, the support for the other platforms entirely because to be honest, I don't think any of them have been compiled in several years, and so they really don't provide us any benefit. Um, also, undergoing, um, in order to facilitate the, the, the client integration with the kernel, is to separate uh, client and server functionality. That is good just from a normal point of view as well, because you're not dragging in a bunch of code that's dead into the client kernel. Um, from the days when, you know, Cluster or Linux 2.4, or when we first started developing Lustre, you know, we've been using all these old APIs and we only reluctantly move to the newer kernel APIs as, you know, the old ones get removed out of the kernel. But there's a lot of new functionality there that we duplicate inside Lustre and could be cleaned up. And so there's definitely an interest in doing that. Dead code removal. Uh, there's a couple of projects um, with Coverity and... Um, Clang to clean up this, you know, dead code in Lustre. It's a big code base. I think there's, um, if my memory serves me, there's over a quarter million lines in the main Lustre code. Um, so that's a lot, as much as all of the other file systems in the kernel put together. And um, Livermore has been working on the build system cleanup, which is long overdue. It's something that hardly anybody understands, and uh, I'm grateful for that. Um, Indiana has um, started a new project, um, or two projects that I'll describe, Shared Key um, Crypto, which uh, simplifies the ability to authenticate and encrypt um, the traffic between clients and servers. And there's existing functionality in Kerberos, which is mostly working, um, but we don't really have anybody who understands it, um, so we don't really test it on an ongoing basis, and there hasn't been really an adopter in the community that steps forward to, to submit patches. Um, Indiana is, is going to be doing shared key in cryptography, which um, leaves the distribu distribution of the keys themselves as out of band of luster. It's your, your carrier pigeon or USB key or um, whatever that you, you transport to some other um, site to have your, your crypto key. But then um, it's very simple to administer. You know, they have a, the client and the server agree on a key and they encrypt and authenticate with each other and then um, you're done. There's not a Kerberos infrastructure. There's not cross-realm um, complexity. Um, and you can have, you know, arbitrary numbers of keys and describing you know, which clients have which keys is, is fairly straightforward. And um, I think initially it's going to have AES-128, um, but, uh, you know, we'll be flexible. And this actually ties in with another uh, Indiana feature, which is UID mapping, so that um, separately administered remote domains with, you know, conflicting UID spaces um, can work, you know, transparently with Lustre. And um, 
in, in conjunction with the, the, the shared key crypto, you can positively identify that clients are coming from the right site so they can't spoof you know, their, their UID maps and access files that aren't belonging to them. And um, the, uh, you know, the local IDs, the, the, the remapping is handled, you know, of course, only on the server side. So, you know, otherwise it would be totally useless. Um, that gives you the, uh, you know, ability. It's not baked into the, the original RFP that's being funded by um, OpenSFS, but this is also very close to being able to give you um, the two com combined to give you essentially virtual subsets of the Lustre file system. Um, so for cloud or something like that, you could potentially put partition your global file system into chunks by consumer and they would be isolated from each other. Um, it's not quite there. There needs to be a little bit of extra work beyond this, but it's definitely a good, uh, a good a foundation for going into something like that if that's of interest to users. Um, so there's a number of, of features that are, are um, that we're proposing to work on um, for upcoming releases. Um, one of them, which I think is really one of the most important features that Lustre is lacking uh, today is uh, file replication. And this is the ability to um, mirror files across multiple OSTs. And really, for a number of years now, um, you know, Lustre is, is been only as reliable as the, the hardware that it runs on. Um, and, you know, generally, you know, it, 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 it will be, R Lustre will run fine until there's a storage hiccup or a network hiccup and things like this. The networking part of things are, would be addressed by, you know, channel bonding. Um, the storage side of things is, is being um, addressed by file replication. And this also allows you to move into more commodity storage. You don't have to have twin-tailed failover storage because that functionality would be handled at the Lustre level. And so it's, it's addressing the redundancy. And also for performance, um, you know, you have 50,000 clients. They all want to read some, you know, one megabyte input file. Um, you know, you can replicate your input file onto all of your OSTs and get um, much better read performance. Um, you know, my, my preference for feature development is that we get useful um, functionality at every stage of the game. And um, the first phase is read-only replication, which sounds kind of funky, because how can you have a, a replica if you didn't ever write it? But um, what this is, is essentially leveraging um, the same functionality as file migration to allow you to have a, a, a copy of the file made in user space and the only functionality that goes into the kernel to create the replica is a, a like a I.O. control to join the two files together and then you have two or more copies of the file and you, you implement on the client side the ability to read you know any of the replicas and it's largely for immutable you know or very rarely changing files but, um, you know, for a number of workloads, Hadoop and things like that, that don't ever let you um, modify the files after they're created, um, you know, this is perfectly acceptable. Um, and, you know, for HPC, you definitely don't want to triple mirror your, you know, 50 petabyte file system. But uh, if you want to mirror some selective set of input files for your job that's waiting, you know, a week in the input queue to get an allocation, that's a, a very important thing, right, for reliability. Um, phase two will be, um, will have write support inside the kernel, so you would get immediate um, mirroring of your files. And, uh, uh, of course, the, well, actually a benefit of the phase one work is that you can create the replica asynchronously, uh, I shouldn't say the word asynchronously, in a, sometime after the fact, right? But it doesn't have to use the main bandwidth of the clients. It can be happening on dedicated nodes. It can be happening very close to the OSTs so that, you know, in HPC, again, your primary um, limitation is 
the right bandwidth when you're doing your checkpoints or your data dumps and things like that. You want to minimize that, you know, five minutes an hour is the guideline. And so in phase one, you would be able to do the replication at some other time. And phase two, I mean, it gives you immediate replicas, but it will require twice the bandwidth from the clients. And so, you know, for better or worse, um, it will give you, you know, your immediate replication. Phase three, um, uh, you know, is, is an extension in terms of uh, doing the, the replication asynchronously, but it has a very complicated model for recovering and making sure the mirrors are consistent. And so um, that's going to probably need um, some of the infrastructure being developed for the exascale work. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure exactly when, I would say I said 2-7, but, um, you know, we'll have to see how those, those two projects line up. Uh, T10 uh, PI is also T10 diff, as it also known as. Um, this is work being done by Zyrtex, and um, so it's a SCSI standard for for tracking end-to-end -end data integrity. Um, you know, it's implemented in uh, in the Linux client. Um, it's also implemented in disk storage, and it gives you um, the ability to ensure that the data you write to disk is uh, um, the data that the application submitted. Uh, speed up a little bit here. Um, small files on the metadata target. Um, for, you know, files less than a megabyte, you get, um, you know, a fair amount of overhead in Lustre. You have a metadata inode, you have an OST inode, you have separate RPCs to access those things. Um, a proposal that we put forward is, is to be able to store small files on the high IOPS storage of the MDT, which gives you be both a better, you know, disk um, I.O. profile, but also reduced overhead. You could even, you know, we have stat ahead in Lustre 2.3, so you fetch the inode attributes as you're doing like a directory traversal. Um, you could also fetch the data in the same RPC and, you know, populate your cache pretty efficiently even across small files, which is interesting. Um, with the, the, the ZFS work that was done um, for 2.4, that opens up um, the ability to have other backing storage and unfortunately there's a bit of a stigma around ZFS despite the fact that, uh, you know, I think it's, it's awesome and, um, you know, everybody should use it. But uh, there's some people, we're looking for other backend storage. ButterFS is still more of an um, investigation phase just because of um, you know, we're not sure that it's actually going to scale to what people need. It's tar primarily targeted at, you know, desktop, you know, single server kind of workloads with a handful of disks, and we're not sure whether it's really going to scale. Um, but uh, with the advanced um, features, snapshots, and things like that, um, there's also going to be need a need for integrating that at the Lustre level to have coordinated snapshots across your OSTs and MDT and being able to access those snapshots inside the namespace of Lustre. But um, those are both, uh, you know, work going forward, and that's it. Um, so, you know, this is just a glimpse. There's definitely other features that are on the, out in the world that I don't know about. I hope that if people are working on things, they communicate early and often to the mailing lists and, um, you know, Let's make Luster great. Oh. Any questions? Questions for Andreas. Looks like Galen's got one. So uh, with, with some of the other file systems like, that use like Cord as an underlying placement strategy, uh, there you can augment it to be rack aware when you're doing like asynchronous replication, right, to do like yep. Whether you're doing parity declustering or whether you're doing, you know, just true replication, uh, have you considered? And maybe you touched on this, and I was zoning out. Um, <laughs> uh, have you thought about incorporating maybe some sort of LNet aware layout so that you could incorporate rack awareness or um, even data center awareness yeah, so in replication? For, for, for replication, um, 
there's not any smarts in Lustre today about that. I mean, my thoughts have been that the, the bootstrap for getting that kind of smarts would be OST pools, and so those could be con configured by the administrator, you know, in any arbitrary manner that they want to say, you know, this this pool of disks or of oh, sorry, this pool of OSTs is on one rack in one row, and when I create a replica, I want to pick a different pool or you know exactly this other pool, right? So that you can you can specify that in any way manually to have it automated. I know there's work in Deos to be rack and you know row and switch and disk tray or whatever aware at the policy engine for of Deos, but it will, you know, I haven't thought of a project yet to integrate that, you know, automatically at the Lustre level, right? There's a, actually, to be honest, there's already in Lustre today, we do like round robin across NIDs, right? And so we do load balance that way in terms of automatically, you know, doing that for fault domain isolation. It's not there, but eventually. Multiple approaches for this are being discussed internally, and Fujitsu also contributed a bit of code that they use for rack awareness, where they actually use the OST index as the position of where the actual OSTs are in the global system, which is one of the ways to do it, I guess, and is kind of an easier one. But for initial implementation of this replication stuff, we decided that the implementation would be simple and we'll offload all of this into the actual replication tools to decide what's where and how to do it. This way we are much more flexible and whenever we see how things roll out, we'll kind of might it to implement it in a more rigid manner in the kernel itself. Uh, Andreas, you um, appended a, uh, on a couple of those slides uh, the note uh, Intel proposal. Is that a proposal in the OpenSFS? Um, uh, kind yeah. of depending on funding then? Um, partly, yes. I mean, i just making a caveat that I don't know we're going to develop um, them for sure. But, um, you know, there's definitely, we're, you know, have done some groundwork in these areas. It's not like these are pie in the sky, you know, I wish we had done these things. But these are, you know, real projects. And yes, we've submitted them to OpenSFS as, as uh, features developed. And, and then kind of sim on a similar line, um, the uh, migration work, the data migration work, uh, was that from you or CEA that was, and is that an actual plan or a thought at this point? Um, so the, the, the LFS migrate is actually in 2.4, right? It actually works today. Oh. And um, so the, the usage of that, I mean, the reason it says 2425 is that sort of the productization of, of this is still needed. I mean, it's, it's a command and it has a syntax, but it's not really described as a feature of, you know, how you use it and what you can do with it. It's just having to be actually it's almost like part of how we tested, we're testing layout lock and layout swap for HSM. But it's, I, I think it, it deserves calling out because it's so, potentially so powerful, but there's still work to be done in terms of it needs, a, uh, you know, documentation in the manual and something to drive it to actually be useful in real world. Okay, it's 10 o'clock. We're going to have to stop. Yeah. Uh, right, let's hear from Andreas. I'm sorry? One question. Okay, one more. Andreas, as I see in your presentation, you present a shared security for Lustra, but uh, what is different with Kerberos in case we will send one ticket to the one host? So as I see, n no differences between uh, Kerberos, which uh, sent one Kerberos ticket to hosts and to this. So I mean, part of the difference is that you have to have Kerberos running. And there's an administrative hurdle, especially if you're doing it in WAN, in order to get you know, the, the security infrastructure to open up, um, you know, cross-realm authentication um, between domains and things like this. And, um, you know, to be honest, I'm not a Kerberos expert. And unfortunately, I think there's really not that many people that understand Kerberos because, you know, 
nobody at Intel does. <laughs> so, oh no, sorry, that's not at Intel. In our group, I, I, there are definitely people at Intel that understand and actually have one of our Intel security people looking over the design of this. But it's just administratively a lot easier to say, here's a file with the keys or here's the 20 digit key, right? But, you know, it's not, it's not my area, I'm just, Yeah. Yeah. You know, to be honest. I'm, Sh Shadow, I'm, just, can the, I, can I'm just, just the messenger here. Andreas, so. can I just come in a minute? The reason that there is a new security mechanism here is because of administration. Uh, when you're doing, okay, you know, so when, when you're doing I, security across a WAN, uh, it's about, uh, with Kerberos, you're basically um, throwing open trust um, to uh, remote sites without uh, much control over it. And this gives the uh, system administrator of the site that, that is um, exporting WAN capability much finer grain control over who he trusts and who he doesn't. Yeah, so, I mean, and I'm, you know, don't discuss this with me. What you should do if you have... If you have some concerns about this, it would make sense to join the working group and then you can discuss them there because I, you know, am not the expert in this. So, thank you. <laughs>